Welcome everyone. I'm Jessica Newworth, Director of the Human Rights Program at Roosevelt House Hunter College. And I want to welcome all of you to our first virtual lunchtime event. Um, very sad that we can't be together in person, but there is a silver lining to Zoom, as it turns out, which is that we can talk to people like Josh Lyons, who is joining us from Switzerland. Um, I want to thank Christina Avila and Hector Perez from our program for all their work to organize this event. And I'm going to jump right in since we're a few minutes late, um, for which I apologize, and introduce Josh Lyons, who is the Director of Geospatial Analysis at Human Rights Watch, which deals with satellite, drone, and artificial intelligence technology in the service of human rights research. Mr. Lyons is also a member of the Technology Advisory Board to the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, and he's contributed to many UN investigations, including the Gaza Report in 2009, the Secretary General's Panel of Experts on Sri Lanka in 2011, and the ongoing work of the Commission of Inquiry on Syria and the fact-finding mission on Myanmar. So thank you so much, Josh, for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to learning more about your cutting edge work for human rights. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for having me. It's an, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Um, should I we jump right in? Um, just just out of sorry, out of curiosity, how many people do we have now presently? Just uh, just so I know. Uh, Twenty. Twenty-two. Ah, brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, um, for uh, for joining. And let me see if I can start sharing my screen. Um, I understand probably uh, after uh, the uh, entertainment last night that uh, many of you are quite uh, frazzled and tired and uh, excited. And so I thought um, it was uh, maybe an irresistible uh, opportunity to really come um, approach this larger discussion about technology and human rights um, from a sort of a, let's say, a playful or provocative standpoint and, and include into this discussion some of the questions that we face on a daily basis when confronted with governments primarily who are using advanced technologies essentially to contradict, to challenge, to, to create a, uh, a false narrative about the investigations that, that, we, that we conduct um, on, on countries all around the world. So let me just share my screen and hopefully this will work. It looks like it's working now. Perfect. Let me just start this in slideshow mode. So here we go. And hopefully it will start. There we go. So, well, listen, we're always talking about new technologies and I think just to put this into context, what's, what's interesting to me is to think about the ways in which not only NGOs and human rights organizations and humanitarians are, are using technology in a way ordinary people are, are using new technologies, but, but to put that into the context of how governments have been using new technologies actually for quite, quite a long time. And you know, having, you know, having grown up in the Cold War, um, what's fascinating to me is to see really just how profoundly things have changed. Um, for good and for bad, and I wanted to illustrate that th this this transformation that we've had in the last twenty years through a, a simple stack of images, and and hopefully what you see now is um, does anyone well normally I would ask if we were in a in a room together physically if if everyone anyone recognizes this location by any chance and um, what we're looking at now is an American spy image taken over Tibet, over, over Lhasa, the, 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 grand, the palace in, in, in Lhasa. Um, and this was recorded just a few months before the start of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, where substantial um, portions of, of this palace and, and, and Tibetan monasteries and historic um, artifacts had, were destroyed um, in, in the... Uh, in the, the months that um, that followed, and in in many ways, so this was actually a this was a spy image taken in 1966, I believe in March of 1966, and in many ways this is as good or as better than anything available today. Obviously, it's 
it's in black and white, it's not in color, but, but this is not the full resolution image. There's, it's actually much more detailed and you can zoom in and see people and cars and details that normally I wouldn't be, be able to do even today. And this was taken with a, a satellite that was shooting film, large format film. And when it was finished taking photographs, it would eject that canister of film and it would parachute back to earth and, and a plane would actually try and catch it in mid-flight over the Pacific Ocean. And for that time, we believe that the Soviet Union had um, comparable technology. This is now well over 50 years ago. Now, I'm gonna show you a second image. All right, now, now you have to all guess what is it? Well, it, although it looks like some type of abstract art or a um, bizarre, um, you know, pointillist or cubist uh, painting, it's actually the very same location. It is Lhasa, Tibet. Um, and this was taken with the world's most advanced civilian satellite sensor over 10 years later. Okay, it was taken with Landsat 2. And this was the state of the art in, 19, in the 1970s for civilians, for, for everyone, except intelligence agencies around the world. This is what you could expect with the world's most advanced civilian satellite technology. And more or less, this remained essentially state of the art for, well, up until um, 1999. And what happened in 99 is that the Americans decided um, uh, after the Cold War that they would declassify and commercialize a lot of this technology. And, and at the same time, you know, um, they also did something else which, which has changed our lives, which is they've, excuse me, unscrambled the GPS constellation system, the global positioning system of which you use and everyone uses on a daily basis to, to go about your daily lives and figure out how to go where you need to go. Um, the GPS system is a military system. It's, it is a, it's a system run by the Pentagon and it was, it was scrambled. It was encrypted basically uh, until 99. And before that moment, you really couldn't use it for anything. And so 99, 2000 really re represents for our purposes, a big bang in technology. It really represents that moment when all of a sudden humanitarians and human rights organizations could start to do things that were impossible before that point. And just to highlight this, so I just wanted to show you, um, one of the amazing opportunities and capabilities now that, that is available essentially to the world um, are these microsatellites. And in, the, in this particular case, what we'll, we'll see is a time series of satellite images acquired from Planet. So you, formerly it was called Planet Labs and now it's just branded as Planet. And this is a company based in, in, in San Francisco. And they have a constellation of over 160 or plus now uh, microsatellites, more or less the size of a small toaster or a loaf of bread, if, if, you, if people still buy loaves of bread, I don't know. Um, and these satellites are really built from off the shelf technology that, that is uh, available to everyone. And what it's able to do is something that was impossible before. So I wanna show you this right now. Um, what we're seeing is these are villages, these are Rohingya villages in Myanmar and Burma, immediately after the ethnic cleansing. So this is a village, these are villages that were burned to the ground. We're not able to see the burned buildings themselves, but this is after the village has been destroyed, but the trees and the foundations are still there. And what happened next is the military came in and bulldozed the entire remnants of the villages. They destroyed all vestiges of the Rohingya community. And this is what we'll see. Oh, sorry, that's not what we'll see. Let me push play here. So if you'll see on the upper left-hand side, this is January 8th, 10th, 18th, 20th, 29th, then to February. And you see that the, the lush green vegetation is erased and it's, it's you know, replaced with bare soil and with newly constructed buildings of which are officially there to rehouse the Rohingya once they returned, but unofficially that's actually for 
to consolidate the ethnic cleansing. It's there, it's there actually to house uh, ethnic Rakhine and other, nation, uh, other ethnicities, basically to repopulate and consolidate the ethnic cleansing. So what this, this planet technology gives us is this new capability to monitor remotely um, events on the ground that we physically don't have access to. And that provides us with this fascinating capability. It, Human Rights Watch, if you remember, really is a pen and paper organization. It's an old fashioned analog boots on the ground, pen and paper investigative um, organization to meet people who are witnesses, who are survivors, and sometimes even the perpetrators to document what happened. But as we all know, obviously, there's many limits to what you can do when you have to physically visit the site. You have to physically meet the survivors. If there's no one left, if everyone has been killed, if everyone is hiding in, in the jungle, if it's simply too dangerous, if we don't have access, then what do you do? And that really is the, the role of new technology. And so now what we're talking about now is um, this rapidly expanding set of, of geospatial data sources and research methods. And this is just a small sample, but, but um, as mentioned, uh, starting at the upper left-hand side, the microsatellite constellations. Again, these, these, th those, th those satellites, they're, they're probably just about 12, 12 inches um, long, and, and you could easily pick one up. They're quite light. Um, we're using thermal anomaly satellite sensors to detect fires in real time nighttime lights data, um, synthetic aperture radar, the drones that you you've, should be familiar with. And then also one of my favorites, declassified spy imagery. So the, the reason why I was able to show you that image of Lhasa um, Tibet from 1966 is because the satellite data itself was declassified. And so the entire Cold War archives of what the Americans were looking at throughout the 1960s and 70s and part of the 1980s has basically been declassified for the world. Unfortunately, a large portion of that still has yet to be actually digitized. So it's, it's prohibitively difficult to work with, but it's a gold mine for a whole range of purposes. And, and just so again, just to give you an idea that these just represent some of the many different technologies. Now, internally to Human Rights Watch, well, there's a new technology every day, and they all sound quite interesting. But at the same time, Human Rights Watch is doing research on the role of new technology in, in the commission of human rights abuses, right? In what ways are new technologies being used by governments, by, by criminal organizations, by non-state actors, and by ordinary people to attack, to intimidate, to repress uh, people? And so there's this obvious obligation on the part of Human Rights Watch and, and part of uh, arguably uh, an, an obligation for all of us to have this debate and discussion and think about the ways in which all of these new technologies are really fantastic to do incredible things, but also simultaneously, in many ways, the same technology poses um, profound risks and, and direct um, threats to, to, to our human rights um, on a daily basis. So just to illustrate this, thinking quickly, what would be some of the types of new te technological tools that we might or are now using to defend human rights, to document human rights abuses? Well, artificial intelligence is an obvious one. Social media, open source investigations obviously are, are, are critical. Satellites, drones, ground sensor networks, those are, those are being used as we speak. Big data analytics, geodemographics is something also that we use. Encryption, obviously, is how we keep our researchers safe. It's how people transmit um, information to us. It, encryption is an essential component to protect people in a digital age. And then we have blockchain, cryptocurrencies. This is, these are very hot topics, especially with, within operational humanitarian agencies. There's a lot of discussion about how food distribution, aid, um, humanitarian documentation, um, registration of IDPs and refugees for, for aid might be aided and, and useful with, with blockchain. Um, and biometrics are now currently being used by um, WFP, uh, UNHCR, the Refugees Agency, and, and, and many others. 
And then facial recognition. Well, there are obviously many cases where we have videos or photographs of perpetrators doing horrific crimes. And we would love to use facial recognition in the abstract, perhaps, to try and identify who they are. But at the same time, we're doing research on the profound, the profound harm that facial recognition is happening right now in, in the criminal justice system in particular. And so the ones that have question marks relate directly to things that we are highly uncertain and divided about. And, and really, it's, a, it's an open debate and discussion. Should we even think about using these technologies in the future? And if we did, how would we go about doing it? How would we rationalize it and, and guard, safeguard um, against potential harm? Well, what are the risks? What are the threats? It's more or less the same. Artificial intelligence, social media, facial recognition. One big difference, fully autonomous lethal weapon systems, killer robots, satellites and drones, big data analytics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, internet of things, biotech. Um, the list goes on and on. And this really does represent the sort of the, the paradox, the challenge and the opportunities that we face at this moment in time. Um, I, I obviously I do want to I want to save a, uh, some time for you know for for the discussion um, as as possible with the Zoom, but I do want to highlight the two. I, I would think if we were going to highlight the two existential risks, the the, the profound risks to human rights um, posed by new technologies, they really are encapsulated in 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 two two categories. The first is AI for mass surveillance and social control. And I, hopefully everyone is familiar um, with the situation and the allegations of, of um, you know, potential crimes against humanity by the Chinese authorities in Zhang province against the, the ethnic Uyghur and, and other um, Turkish um, minorities within Zhang province in the western part of China. And it, you, you may have seen you know, a lot of images, a lot of videos, of satellite images of, of these massive incarceration camps, these re-education camps as the Chinese you know, the euphemism for it. Um, what's important about this from a technological standpoint is that, that in, in many critical ways, Zhang province is an incubate, it's a tech incubation system for the Chinese regime to perfect this system of systems. It is in, in, in all ways an, an incredibly impressive and yet terrifying um, process that we see unfolding where they are in, in rapid, in real time, rolling out a whole range of new technologies basically to create um, this to perfect what they are calling, obviously now, the, this, the, the, the so, social credit system, which is, uh, as you can see, to, to make um, trustworthy people, um, uh, to fast track uh, the, the, the ability of, of um, good citizens to obtain loans, to buy a house, to buy a car, to go to school, to go to university, to be employed, um, and to punish bad people, thought criminals, anyone who has done anything that a ground sensor, a, a camera, a microphone, um, any number of, of digital surveillance um, data points that might, might have captured behavior that is somehow um, uh, verboten, it's, it's forbidden, it's, it's, um, un, un, you know, it's, it's behavior that is uh, counter to the vision of what uh, the state wants, which is total and, and complete social and political and economic control. And the risk obviously now in the perfection of this system, I know it's not, it, you know, it's, it's constantly expanding and it's, it's, it's evolving and it, it is a system of systems. So it's an integration of, of thousands of different technologies. They're all being mixed together. And the risk now is that this is going to start to be exported around the world, particularly in the Belt and Road Initiative context. It's gonna start coming to other countries in Africa and Asia and Latin America very quickly. Um, and then, sorry, the other one being fully autonomous lethal weapons, killer robots. Um, I urge you, if you haven't seen it, to please go ahead and, and take a look at the, the, the campaign to stop killer robots, 
which we're, 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 we've helped to found and, and co-chair. And then the objective here really is to, whoops, sorry, to, um, to provide, to, to build momentum for an international uh, ban on, on the development, deployment, and use of fully autonomous lethal weapon systems. This, think any killer robots, Hollywood doomsday movie, and that is more or less exactly what is being envisioned as we speak. Um, I, sorry, I, 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 how much time do we have? Um, I, I know we've got, there's so many things I'd love to show you, but I do want to, I don't want to run over. How, how much time do we have? Uh, you're, you're good. You could, you could take another 10 or 15 minutes if you want. Okay, very good. Well, as, as I mentioned to start, um, those are the two big threats. Now, from my vantage point, my primary role within Human Rights Watch is, is, is to really to try and develop and to utilize these new technologies, not only to try and identify the potential harm, but most importantly, to identify opportunities for us to use these technologies to advance our research, to, to strengthen the research, to, to fight uh, for human rights and to hold perpetrators uh, accountable. And in order to do that, we really do have an, a, a larger ethical and professional obligation to understand the ways in which not only technologies can really help, but the ways in which technologies can really hurt, not deliberately hurt, but, but actually can be accidental. Um, and as the, the risk and the problem with technologies, as we all know, is no matter how good they are, they in, invariably lull us into a false sense of security and trust, and we end up doing silly things with them. We drive places we shouldn't drive because the GPS told us to. Um, we do things that we shouldn't do because we've, we've, we've trusted the technology to the extent that we've, we've, we've given far too much um, control. And we've, we've really, let's see, we've, it, it's, it's almost a form of, of hypnotism where we've, we've really willfully failed to understand the ways in which we're using the technology wrongly um, and it's misleading us. And, and for, for me, uh, starting out my career um, in, and in this time at the start of, of, the, um, uh, of the Gulf War in 2003, it, this slide really embodies in my mind the, the, the unique perils of new technology and, and in, in some ways inspired me to come to Human Rights Watch at, from the beginning. This is, a, this is an image of the Secretary of State Colin Powell presenting to the Security Council what he argued at the time were satellite image, it was satellite image evidence of Iraqi weapons of mass destruction infrastructure. And, and the images you see on the right hand side were, were you know, detailed images um, annotated by, by dozens of, of world experts in imagery, satellite imagery and analysis. And yet there was a small problem with this presentation. It was completely wrong. The satellite images were, were, were correct insofar as that they were real, they were real photographs of real locations. They had not been doctored. It was the interpretation that was wrong. And, and the, the key issue here was simply, they had no one on the ground. They had no ability to, to verify and, and substantiate the interpretations. And, and no matter how advanced your technology, if you don't have people on the ground, if you don't have contacts, if you don't really have an ability to independently corroborate and cross validate between different data sources, you're ultimately going to be left um, in a situation where you are just guessing. And in this context, this catastrophic failure of interpretation led ultimately to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Iraqi lives. Um, let's fast forward. What we see now is most definitely um, a very advanced ways in which governments are using new technologies to challenge our new technologies. And now what we end up with is, is um, a, a very, very strange and paradoxical situation where um, we're, we're talking about fake satellite news to be, to be, let's say, blunt about it. 
So in this particular case, did the Russian forces bomb a market in Marat Alnuman? Well, this was an allegation from um, 2019, and we, we've actually just releasing a report about this, so I'm giving a little bit of a teaser. Um, the Russians, after the media reported this allegation of, of Russian airstrikes on a marketplace of which killed many, many civilians, the Russians flew a drone over the marketplace. And this Russian colonel, um, uh, uh, Sergei uh, Ruskoy, he presented the drone imagery and he said, the drone imagery proves the market is intact, it's functional, and we are innocent. We have absolutely not bombed a marketplace. And it's very convincing. There's just one small problem. The marketplace is in a different location. The marketplace that was bombed, of which we were able to identify the damages and relate those damages to social media, was actually 350 meters to the northwest. What they did was quite clever, it's quite cheeky. They just simply showed everyone a different image of a different location. It's a very, very simple low tech, in many ways a low tech sleight of hand to deflect attention. But the reality of course is that the satellite imagery, as well as their drone imagery, because I, I'm certain the full footage of their drone imagery captured the destruction of the actual marketplace. All of that information is still primary potential evidence for, for uh, in a war crimes tribunal. So it doesn't get the Russians off the hook from this vantage point of international justice, but it does provide them with a level of um, protection in, in terms of propaganda and confusing the public. That very same colonel, if you see now, actually did exactly the same thing when they bombed a hospital in Aleppo. And they showed satellite imagery of the hospital and they argued convincingly that the hospital had not been destroyed. There's one small problem. The bomb crater and the damages to the hospital actually are are, are, are almost entirely obscured because they're underneath that white box, the graphic they put purposefully on top to help you see where the hospital is, is actually hiding the evidence that's on your screen, right? Another very clever sleight of hand. Um, I had this uh, a unique opportunity um, to have my work denounced officially at a press conference. Um, this, is, uh, this, this is the chief of staff, uh, uh, Zote, at a press conference. He's the he was the chief of staff then for the state counselor's office. So he was the chief of staff for Aung San Suu Kyi, the Nobel Peace Prize winner. And after Human Rights Watch published uh, a satellite-based report on military destruction of multiple villages in Mongda Township, in November of 2016, um, the, the state counselor's office held an impromptu and surprise press conference where they held up the report and then they look familiar. They did something very similar to what the Russians have done. They presented aerial photography of the destroyed villages and they compared that with our satellite imagery and they came to the same conclusion that Human Rights Watch had grossly exaggerated um, the, the, the extent of the damages. And by the way, all of the damages that were visible were actually by the Rohingya communities themselves burning, burning their villages down in an act of self-immolation. There's one small problem, and we've heard this before. Um, their aerial photography actually showed the opposite of what they said it showed. It actually showed not only all of the destruction that we had documented, but it actually revealed more destruction that we, than we were aware of at the time because it had happened after we had published our report. So actually we published the report, then there was continuing destruction. The Burmese went and dutifully and expertly documented Crime, their own crimes against the Rohingya community, and then published evidence of their crimes to the world, 
and said the opposite. And again, it was exactly the same impact. It was effective for, for the purposes of causing confusion and deflecting blame. But from an evidentiary standpoint, their, their imagery and this exercise in pure propaganda still has profound evidentiary value in any potential future legal proceeding, potentially as well within the, the International Court of Justice uh, Gambia versus Myanmar genocide trial that's, that's, that's just starting. Um, I could go to a, a lot more examples here, maybe one more. Um, did thousands of Syrians abandon their vehicles? This is an obscure case back in 2014, but, but it, was an, it was an important one. What's, what's valuable about this case is in the Russian case and in the, the Burmese case and, and in others, it was a deliberate attempt at sowing confusion. In this case, it was an accidental mistake, similar to the, to the arguably to the, to the Colin Powell presentation. If you see in these two images that these are before, this is an image allegedly of Syrians desperate to escape an ISIS attack on the border with Turkey. And you see that map, it's clearly labeled Turkey and Syria. There's one small problem with this. Well, rather it's, it's actually there's three. Um, they have not abandoned their vehicles. There's, they were still there at the time. They're not at a border crossing and they're not in Syria. They actually had already left Syria and they were trapped inside a Turkish minefield at the time. And unfortunately, this, this rather basic and elementary mistake by the UN, um, I mean, it, it would have taken three seconds basically um, for, for an analyst to have corrected this mistake, but they didn't, unfortunately. And the Turkish government used this mistake by the UN to great effect, basically to argue that, um, that these Syrians were in Syria and therefore it would be hypocritical for the U Europeans and Americans to argue for Turkey to let them all in while the Europeans are trying desperately to keep Syrian refugees out of Europe at the same time. So it was a semantic argument and they used it to great effect and it caused substantive harm. But these mistakes happen over and over and over again. And this really is the profound obligation on the part of Human Rights Watch and, and for everyone who, who uses these new technologies to not make the situation worse. And you may have heard, you know, that very almost a sort of a, you know, a prosaic uh, euphemism now within the UN of, of do no harm. It, it, it's, it doesn't really mean what much because people interpret it differently and it, it has very little operational utility in practice. But the concept is informative and useful to the extent that it means whatever you do, don't make things worse. And when you release maps like this, when you, when you misinterpret images or drones or you tweet the wrong thing or you, you accidentally retweet a video that you think is about Syria but actually was from Iraq, you're causing more harm. You're not helping, you're only hurting. And in those circumstances, you, the ethical obligation is to not publish if you're not certain. Um, I, I think I just want to leave it for there and maybe we, we just, I'm going to, I'm going to um, stop sharing or maybe I, I'll just fast forward here. There's a lot more, but let me just pop to discussion. Yeah? Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so again. much. That's so interesting, uh, Josh. Um, and I'll, I'll if I under, if I uh, thank you so much, it's so Great. interesting. And we already uh, have a question. I'm going to pass on to you, um, which is from Pat, uh, who may want to jump into the conversation, which um, you're welcome to do more live, Pat. Um, but I'll read the question. When an official offers an image of the wrong location to deny something was bombed, um, can't Human Rights Watch demand to see the data to verify the latitude and longitude? And and in the case, and one of the examples you gave us, I mean, it, it would seem like could Human Rights Watch now that it has the same technology, just put the same image out there without that label covering the place that's actually been destroyed? Sure. And is it just become a battleground? This is sort of my addition to the question. Is it, you know, is it, is it an old battle of what's the truth on a new battleground or is it different because of the technology? Well, 
I mean, the you're you're muted. Sorry. Okay. There we go. The, the short answer is we we do publish. Um, I mean, as you saw, it is relatively straightforward to reverse engineer their imagery. It, it doesn't take much effort. Um, I mean, normally they go to great lengths to show you the correct location, um, including providing coordinates. Um, the, the, the challenge, obviously, is you, you, saw, you saw the colonel. Um, he's at an official Russian press conference in Moscow. We're not invited. Um, we're not aware of when that press conference has happened. And that misinformation, that disinformation goes out. It goes out on Russia Today. It goes out on all state-controlled media channels. And it becomes it becomes the truth. It is the official statement of fact. And I mean, what's powerful about that type of disinformation is, is that it, it really becomes a narrative about dueling interpretations. So no matter how much I can, I can articulate and explain the correct locations and the nuances of the, of the, the sleight of hand and the ways in which they've, they've subtly tried to confuse people, um, that's not in real time. That happens after their, mis their, their disinformation. And then, then the question is, you know, are we reaching the same audiences? Do we have, now Human Rights Watch is, is especially good at, at um, you know, international media and, and obtaining press coverage. That's not a problem. But having this picked up and honestly and accurately and fairly presented on Russia Today or other state controlled channels is, is a profound challenge. And in point of fact, it just simply doesn't happen. Or if it does happen, it happens in ways that, that are weak. It could be days or weeks later, in which case it really is, it's, it's, a, it's a lost opportunity. So um, in that sense, we don't have expectations that the imagery technology will allow us to convince mass millions of people. It, this is more importantly for us to strengthen the resolve and confidence of let's say international investigators, le legal tribunals, prosecutors, investigators, who, who otherwise might not address that particular case example. They might think it's, it's too nebulous or too uh, ambiguous, and then they will just move on to something more certain. And so in the case of, of, of Aung San Suu Kyi's um, attack on her work, I went to Burma then um, um, in, you know, quickly there afterwards, not with any real expectation we would be able to meet with 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 the government um although that was a, it was a theoretical possibility it didn't obviously happen but we did then go to the embassies we went to the u.n agencies and briefed them thoroughly on our findings to neutralize that type of of misinformation so to the extent that we can use the technology we we do it in a way that we believe is it maximizes its utility and will have the biggest impact in that in that context Okay, uh, Julian, you have a question. Uh, hi, um, so my question is, does the United States government have a list of like conflicts or regions that they actively monitor using, using this technology? Because I imagine the case of like, for example, the second Congo war where there's like 14 different parties, it must be a multi-million dollar endeavor to monitor accurately like those situations. So does the US kind of pick where they wanna know what's going on? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's a great question. Um, I mean, one of the fascinating things I've, I've started to look at just, you know, in basically in my spare time are the footprints of the spy images during the Cold War. Um, the footprints are available and you can actually start to see what were they looking at and what were they not looking at. Um, and, and for example, in one case, there was a possibility, although it didn't happen, but um, there was a, um, a, a Guatemalan um, general, um, Rios Montz, I believe, um, a, a death squad commander um, who led uh, the, the murder of uh, Kiche Mayans in, in, in Guatemala and, and was, was, being, was held on trial for, for genocide. And there was this, a small opportunity to potentially obtain newly released American spy images recorded under Ronald Reagan 
of the highlands of, of Guatemala that would show several things. First, it would, it would document the destruction and validate the testimony. But more interestingly, it would also show what the Americans knew at the time as it related to the, the genocidal scorched earth tactics of, of Rios Montt and other, um, uh, other military commanders who were being uh, you know, directly supported by, by the CIA at the time. And it, would have, it could have potentially helped quite, quite a lot Unfortunately, the imagery wasn't actually available yet. And then he was eventually, the trial was, um, was, was um, acquitted because of his health. But um, in, in many cases, the, the satellite imagery that we're using are commercial satellites that can also be used, um, that are used by the American government, the French and, and, and many others. It is, possible, it is possible to monitor conflicts with this technology but it's, it's very hard, even today. Um, there are many parts of Syria, for example, that, that, are, that are essentially terra incognita. Um, there are parts of Syria that, that are west or east of you know, the main conflict zones that have not been imaged for months at a time. And then we really have no remote ability to assess what happened. So for example, the, you know, various cases of where ISIS has destroyed world heritage sites, the Palmyra and, and others, there's very little satellite imagery actually of some of these incidents precisely because it's being oversubscribed and tasked on other locations. So it, it actually, it, it, it can go both ways. Um, but with the new satellite constellations now, I mean, it's gone from one satellite to now probably over 50 um, the, of the highest quality resolution. And I've, I've stopped counting simply because there's just too many now. So go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question if nobody has a question. Sure, go ahead. So um, you just mentioned, are, so does human rights organizations that are interested in the material that this technology reveals, do you guys have to like, go and talk to like the state actors involved and be like you know the cia we want to look at this part of burma for this reason and is there kind of like an informal process where they release information to you or do you guys need your own satellites your own sources well uh, the the easy answer is that, that if there was an obligation then we would just wouldn't use the technology that that would be it would just be in violation of our of our core principles of independence and and uh, and autonomy from from any state actor, no, I mean, you you just simply need a credit card, really, um, if you want to buy the images. I mean, Google Earth is providing. I mean, essentially, Google Earth is is doing the same thing that many others are doing. They're buying um, they're buying satellite images and they're paying an uplift fee, it's called, um, to, for a license to show the world those new images. Um, and in many cases, you know, there are fairly new satellite images in, in Google Earth. And in some cases, we just don't, we don't even need to buy anything because it's already been uploaded. But in other cases, no, um, we would you know, buy an existing image from a commercial vendor uh, in the same way that you would buy, you know, uh, you know, you buy a movie online or, or, or anything else for that matter. And so um, in some cases, we might have to actively task, order, essentially program a new image to be acquired um, when, when it's something that's very, very urgent and there's nothing readily available. Um, but this is all entirely um, commercial and or scientific. So a lot of the data that we use is, is simply you know, it's it's freely available under a Creative Commons uh, licensing agreement uh, um, from the Euro European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, the, the American uh, NASA. Um, there's there's just a tremendous amount that's available to everyone at the moment. Thank you. So maybe I can ask a follow-up question on that, and and some kind of dumb technical questions. So I'm no. a bit of a newcomer to this, but it's fascinating, and I guess. Um, it's commercially available, so it sounds like you're acquiring your imagery from third-party type of vendors rather than anything that you're 
capturing on on your own independently. So I, one thought is, are there security issues with that? And is there any reason that a third party vendor couldn't do the same manipulation of data that a government might do to make it unreliable? Like, is there a way that you can independently verify data um, or do you just trust these vendors? Um, and then from the vendor point of view, when you're looking at sensitive areas in various countries, again, technology wise, I don't know, but I assume maybe not, maybe you're so high above the earth, it's like you don't have to be in their airspace, but are there issues where you need to be in their airspace and then it becomes a question of you know, territoriality and are you doing this surreptitiously or openly? Yeah. A host of questions yeah. around that. No, those are brilliant core questions. Um, let, let me start with the, the last one first. Um, there, there was a there was a treaty protocol proposed under the U.S. Eisenhower administration, an Open Skies Treaty Agreement, uh, that he proposed with um, the, uh, Khrushchev. It it was not actually adopted, uh, but it essentially became a uh, de jure uh, practice, both by the Americans and the Soviets, of an Open Skies uh, standard, which meant essentially that that territoriality, sovereign airspace did not expand in, extend beyond the troposphere or whatever they, I, I don't remember the, the technical limits. It, I think it is just basically outer space. Um, and then that, that is subjected to, you know, the, the international, there's a, treaties on, r rules on, on, on the outer space uh, governance issues. And, but oversight, overflight is, is essentially ungoverned. There is no territoriality. There's no right um, of governments to prohibit us from taking a photograph of their state. That's not to say that there are not restrictions. So what, what, one of the, there was a thing called the Kyle Bingham Amendment um, that was uh, an amendment to the um, U.S. rule that, that authorized the commercialization and, and um, a declassification of the American spy technology for satellite imagery. And this was a restriction that that limited the resolution of images over the state of Israel to to arbitrarily to a level of two meter pixel resolution. Essentially, it degraded the quality so that people could not use it to, uh, you know, theoretically launch or an attack on Israel or or to conduct surveillance. Um, and and that was that was not an international treaty. It was an American policy, and then the Americans basically mandated obliged other satellite providers around the world to adhere to that standard or risk essentially have have their acts have um, a, a tariff a, um, an embargo on on their satellite data so everyone complied that actually I believe has now been repealed uh, over 20 years later um, so there is a process now by which that has been re restricted in the past the Americans tried to um, let's say censor American satellite commercial data by buying it all up. They bought up exclusive rights to it through a commercial provision. Um, they did this over Afghanistan and then it proved to be prohibitively expensive but great for the company. And then at some point they, they, they realized it really wasn't necessary. Um, they, they had these debates in the 1990s and the Rand Corporation, if you're familiar with them, published a, a seminal piece on it basically saying, on the one hand, we have all this fantastic technology that would make a lot of money and be very useful to people because it's all top secret now and only a few people can use it. We're really not using the technology in any way to its fullest capacity. And on the other hand, if we make a lot of money with it, we'll give it away and essentially lose our monopoly of surveillance and we'll give that away to the world. And, and in that post-Cold post War judgment, the, their, their ideological commitment to free markets won out over their, 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 um, their uh, sense of, of duty to protect state monopoly on surveillance. And so they advocated for the commercialization and that's, Thankfully, what happened, they lost that monopoly, uh, and it is essentially now um, freely available. Now, that relates directly to the first question. I would love nothing more in my career to see doctored satellite images um, for, for that purpose. I, it would just be fantastic. Um, 
it would be amazing to see. Uh, it, it would be amazing because it would be such a futile effort. Why? Because of the free market. There are so many other satellite data providers from other countries. There's the Chinese satellites I can use. There's the South Koreans, there's the Taiwanese, the Indonesian, the Nigerian, the Brazilians, the French, the, I mean, it's, 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 it's basically now the question is who doesn't have a satellite company? Uh, um, and so if anyone tried to manipulate a satellite image, well, it would look rather silly because someone else would show side by side five other images. Well, the Americans image shows this, but the Russians, the Chinese, the Japanese, the French, the Europeans, the English, they all, they all show something completely different and it would be exposed in very short order. And essentially it would be, it would be commercial suicide um, for a vendor you know, any type of vendor or a data collector to, to try and, and do that. Um, from a technological standpoint, it isn't really feasible even if they wanted to try, because in many cases, these are live feeds. When we task, for example, a, a planet satellite image or a French uh, Airbus image, it's being acquired, it's, it's tran being transmitted into a, a ground receiving station in Norway, it's processed autonomously and basically transmitted to us through an FTP or, or, or other channel without any human in that loop. It really is fully autonomous and, and as close to near real time as, as one would, would hope for. So there really is no ability to do that. Um, that's not to say people don't, you know, use, use camouflage. Uh, you know, obviously people are, are using old fashioned techniques it, those still work. So there's many ways around it. You can just do stuff at night because the images are really not being acquired at night. Um, you do it during bad weather and under clouds. There's not much you can do unless you're using radar data. And that's, that's a different question and, and or drones. And so it's a very, very different proposition. Thanks, Larry, very short. Thank you very much, Josh. Very interesting. Uh, just a follow-up question to that that answered much of what I asked. Obviously, these technologies are being developed in many cases by governments, in some cases by private companies. So they deal with it differently. Um, let's talk about, say, in the United States and other so-called market economies. What kind of oversight is there and what efforts might there be by a government to say, You've got this new technology coming along. It's so important strategically for national security. We want to buy it or own it or control it, whatever it is, that that company says, okay, we're not going to go commercial with it because then it'll open up this resource to potential enemies. So what is the relationship between governments and private companies, mm -hmm. let's say in the West, so-called market versus say the Chinese kind of model? Mm -hmm regulation, oversight, anything? Well, um, I mean, it, 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 it is true, certainly, that there are, there are some black box, you know, regulations. Um, the Chinese, ironically, well, here's a, a good example. So there are current American restrictions on the, on the collection and sale of nighttime, very high resolution nighttime lights data. And, and this is a, a very recent capability of, of several companies. And in particular, the American one, Planet, and others have a nighttime lights capability, but, but no one in the American uh, regulatory environment has been authorized to, to basically to do that type of, of data collection. It's now infringing upon the sovereign and unique abilities of, of um, the National Reconnaissance Organization and other groups in, in the US intelligence community. But I, I gather really, um, it's only a matter of time before that, that is, that there's a, they relent and, and facilitate that capability. Why? Well, the, the first company in the world to offer nighttime light data is Israeli. And the second company to offer very detailed and color nighttime lights imagery is Chinese. And so I find it right, it is rather ironic to think that, you know, two rather um, secretive um, uh, states uh, with very closed intelligence uh, uh, policies 
are extremely open and transparent when it comes to this particular type of satellite application. So I think it's only a matter of time. Um, but in general terms, it is the, the, that era of extreme state control really is gone at this point. I, I think it's just it's the new normal. People became uh, it it. You know that there. It, I think this actually did come up um, recently. Uh, maybe Trump had raised this. There is there is a post Cold War um, open skies trans. I forget the technical name for this program, um, but it provides for secure. It's a, it's a security confidence building measure allowing Russian surveillance planes and American surveillance planes basically to fly over each other's countries and and to monitor military facilities in the effort of, of providing, you know, um, transparent um, uh, situational awareness so that everyone feels comfortable with, with, the, with, with the current state of, of the armaments. And so um, people are just used to it. You know, that type of, of open remote sensing from space is something that people just expect and, and benefit from. And the value here is, you know, militaries around the world benefit from commercial open source satellite technology more they benefit more than anyone else because because before when it was secret no one could use it it was just a handful of people who could look at that image and if you remember back trump there was a scandal when trump tweeted out an unredacted sat spy image of a facility in, i believe it was in 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 iran and it was a it was breathtaking and the reason why it the reason why those restrictions are in place is because it took me two seconds to look at that image to understand all what all what all the unique capabilities were of that particular sensor and in, it took about 10 more minutes for a whole community of people to figure out the exact orbit of that satellite and when it was launched to the seconds and every the moment the moment he released that photograph you could see from the shadow and the timing and the orientation that the spatial geometry where it was in space at that moment in time and and it completely burned the satellite as let's say as an intelligence resource because now everyone in the world knows when that thing is flying overhead and when they should they should cover things up um it was quite fascinating hmm. which makes me uh wonder josh are there um we're talking a lot about military use. Um, what about use of this technology for terrorists or other nefarious purposes? I mean, yeah. now that it's kind of opened up, is it widely accessible in a public way? Um, is it traceable? You know, what what kind of what kind of protections are there, if any, on the use of it by yeah. people for harmful purposes? Well, I mean. I should say, you know, before before we before we Human Rights Watch committed really to build a permanent internal research capacity using this type of data, obviously we had you know many many internal discussions on precisely these ethical questions, the, the questions of harm. Um, to what extent is this a potential invasion of privacy? To what extent are we are we um, revealing information that could be used to imprison and attack vulnerable communities. And well, let's say hypothetically, what would be some of the scenarios that we would be uh, um, sensitive to? Uh, hypothetically, we could envision a, a situation where um, there had been, um, let's say, a, an attack uh, in, in the DRC or, or uh, thereabouts by by some rebel army on a, on a village and the, the the survivors of the attack flee and they escape and have encamped themselves in a small in a small opening somewhere in the jungle and we use satellite imagery we discover their location we broadcast that location and then um, you know a rebel army reads BBC, uh, they, they see the, the web page, they get the coordinates, and now they say it's they're that way. And they go and launch an attack. Um, you know, so you hypothetically, there are sort of abstract scenarios where we would we would actively either delay the publication of that work, 
or, or redact it in ways that would be you know, meaningful to prevent people from reverse engineering it. But considering how easy it is and how much I love reverse engineering other people's satellite, redacted satellite works, let's say the Russians, the Burmese, the Nigerians, et cetera, et cetera, it's very easy just to show an image, no matter what you do, someone can figure out everything about it. And so really either you don't release it at all, or, or you, you go ahead and, and, and uh, deal with the consequences. But, but in those cases, if we had any, any substantive doubt or, or there was any lingering fear that this would be problematic, we just simply wouldn't publish. That would be, the, that would, I mean, it's a very low tech solution. We just don't publish if we're not absolutely certain we can mitigate and manage those harms. Um, let me give you one example. And the, the way in which, the way in which this does come up. So in Syria, you may, you may have seen, you know, there were multiple high high profile cases where it turned out ISIS or um, Al Nusra, the, the Al, Al Qaeda affiliate there in Syria had used Google Earth to plan specific types of, of military operations. So they would just zoom into what everyone can zoom into and what my, my children do, hopefully uh, every, every so often. Um, and they planned their attack with the satellite imagery. And, and there, you know, there are pictures of them planning it. Now, for every example of those cases, there are many other examples where we, we would have envisioned that was probably the case. And so, for example, we did a report about secret detention facilities, government detention facilities in, in Damascus. And in that report, we wanted to show satellite images of each of these secret military facilities and detention sites where people were being tortured and, and, summar and summarily executed. And we, we wanted to release also the, the GPS, the, the geographic coordinates for each of these facilities to show the Syrian regime that we were watching and that we knew exactly each facility to make the commanders scared, to make them think twice before they, they continued this, this, this crime against humanity. And immediately, you know, this, my, my, my first reaction to this proposal simply was, well, what happens if we release this information in our report and Al-Nusra or, you know, ISIS or someone else simply uses this report to launch an attack. They, they drive up, a, you know, they drive up, they leave a, a, a car bomb and they detonate it. They, they kill large numbers of soldiers, potentially dozens or hundreds of detainees or civilians who are themselves being tortured, and then potentially killing any number of civilians in, in, in downtown Damascus. It would be catastrophic. We would essentially be aiding and abetting a terrorist attack in some ways. We'd be responsible in, in, some, in some framework. And what was fascinating about that conversation was that the, the, the response of other researchers and, and of the Syrians that we consulted with was, it's an interesting idea, but no one in Damascus would ever do such a thing. Everyone in Damascus, every man, woman, and child in Damascus knows where these facilities are. They're publicly known. They have to be publicly known because no one wants to go near them. And they have big signs saying, this is a giant military site, don't come close or you'll be sorry. Um, the, the, and the, the, it was basically just a 10 minute conversation with several people for them to, 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 to put this concern aside. No, no, actually, everyone knows where these are. There's no way this report would in any way, shape or form be weaponized in that way. And generally speaking, I think that is normally the case that the satellite imagery is not useful for combatants because they're there on the ground already. It is only useful for purposes of informing people who are not on the ground, who are not familiar with it, or who simply have no, no direct access to that location. So it really does have, a, there's a preponderance of value in the utility of this data. It's not to say that drones don't pose a substantive security risk and a privacy risk. That is a different matter. And in, I believe in many ways that there's a qualitative difference. And so we have been in, in discussions and, and some debates with let's say Americans and more open source uh, ideological um, uh, communities who believe data should be unconditionally free, including drone imagery. And I believe that that is a 
that is completely unacceptable and a violation of a whole host of international UN obligations for data protection, for example. I think Julian has another question. Yeah, so are you saying that in terms of um, satellites, drones, these technologies, most countries are, operation, are operating on like a similar level of capacity or for example, like when the French army deploys with the US and Afghanistan, do they have much better intelligence than they would have on their own in Mali? And um, yeah, that's my question. No, the, the French have their own spy satellite constellations. They have their own, you know, there, there's a commercial, it, it, many of these commercial satellites are technically, either they're, they're officially classified as dual use or in practical terms, they're, they approximate a dual use capability. So the French Ministry of Defense have access and tasking ability to use a commercial satellite that's run through Airbus, for example. And so it's a commercial satellite, but the the French uh, have basically, you know, um, you know, use rights so that they can have 10% of the of the operational capacity of that satellite, and then they'll use it for their own purposes. And then it's available for the rest of the planet. Basically, anyone in any country in the world can use that very same technology. But generally, they, I mean, in, you know, Mali or Niger, you'll always have, probably have a lot better data simply because there's no clouds. Um, so there, and, and, but for any, op, I mean, militaries generally don't use satellites for, operational, you know, for targeting purposes. They have planes for that. They have drones for that. Um, satellite imagery might be useful for other types of intelligence gathering or map production, but not for that type of, of, of clear targeting capability. Normally not. Yeah. Thank you. Um. We're running out of time, but I wonder if I could just ask you to say a few words for the less informed about drones. It feels like a lot of the things you've been talking about are more satellite related. Yeah. Um, drones seem smaller, more somehow private. Uh, how does Human Rights Watch interact with drone technology? Is it the same kind of commercial market where you buy imagery, or is it small enough and affordable enough that you kind of have your own drones? Uh, what can drones do other than kill that's helpful? Yeah. Um, we, we own our own drones. Um, and in many ways, these are drones more or less, as, you know, what probably many of your, of many of your faculty and, and, and students have uh, with them as we speak. Um, we, it, the, the drones obviously give us a capability that satellites do not. Um, they fly under clouds. They can go into things and places that a satellite cannot see into. Um, they can collect video, uh, and you know they can they can loiter, and we can we can use them day or night at any time that we want. And they can collect a quality type of data um, that would be impossible through f from space itself. And so. As as you may have seen it in the flyer, there, there's a, there's an um, an a, a drone image that that I took in Syria of an ISIS mass grave that we had operated. Um, I didn't show it, but but you can go online and or we can send the link around. Um, you know, we we used a drone um, to fly into an unexplored cavern that ISIS had used for the, the disposal of, of, um, of bodies, men, mostly men that they had executed. And the, the purpose of the flight basically was, was to try and essentially see what, how deep the cave was, what was at the bottom, and to try and assess the, the, the feasibility of, of future uh, forensic field exhumations um, to actually go down and, and, and recover the, the human remains. And so, and it was also there to, to document the unexploded ordnance, the munitions, the bombs that we knew to be there uh, in order to help make that, that planning possible for the, the forensic recovery. Um, in that case, the drone provided us with the unique ability that, you know, we had been looking at that mass grave for years, um, but, oh, thank you for sending the link. 
Um, but we really couldn't do anything until it was physically possible to actually go there. Once the Kurdish uh, forces had take, had recaptured that from ISIS, then we went and, and conducted the flight. And before that, I had actually flown um, uh, several drones in Lebanon, looking at the waste disposal crisis, the garbage crisis. Um, that was that there was a movement called "You Stink" um, protest movement. It was about waste management and and how um, the the uncontrolled burning of of garbage uh, was affecting the health and uh, primarily of, of children and, and elderly in hundreds of of communities across the country. And so we actually then flew the drone. Um, right over the garbage dumps to try and assess um, aspects to it that we simply couldn't do with with the t the, the, the satellites. Um, in both cases, we did something we don't ever do with satellites, which is get government permission. So, in the case of Syria, well, we had to have official permission from from the Kurdish authorities to travel to that location. Um, for the Lebanese case, we, we actually had to f submit an official form um, to the Lebanese Air Force for f permission. This was, a, this was an obligation that they had passed for all civilians. So any civilian who wants to operate a small handheld drone in Lebanon, they have to get permission from the Air Force. And of course, probably we were the only people who had ever actually applied for permission and th they were quite excited and they said, of course, yes, whatever. Um, so it was really just a formality, but it then that was the first hurdle. And the second hurdle, obviously, is we had to then consider all of the physical risks that we would entail by physically being in that part of the world um, with drones and, and how that might be misconstrued. And, and further then to under, try and understand what the potential uh, privacy implications would be. And so we went to great lengths to try and, and, and restrict the way in which the drone was operating to minimize both the ri risk to ourselves and also to, to avoid any type of, of, of inclusion of, of um, homes of, of, of individuals, of people who are completely unrelated to the, to the research. So, you know, we, had, we, we took about four months to debate and develop and discuss and agree on an ethical code of conduct and, and protocols for the use of drone technology. Um, the problem and the challenge is, is that we, we're, we're a big NGO and we have that ability to do that type of, of due diligence, but many other smaller groups just simply don't have the, that time, that luxury and the resources. And the challenge really is to try and you know, diversify the, 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 the lessons learned that we have and share that with others so that we're really all sort of, you know, essentially operating in the same ethical framework to, to keep ourselves safe and to keep, keep uh, civilians safe at the same time. That is a whole new world, it sounds like. Um, I think, let's see. Is that it? Julian, did you have another question or is that the same from before? No, I'm okay, sorry. Okay, great. Well, I know speaking for myself, at least I have learned an enormous amount listening to you, Josh. I wanna thank you so much for, for sharing all of this with us. It, it does seem like a new universe that's got a lot of potential and is fraught with a lot of challenges as well. Um, so it's good that Human Rights Watch is in the mix, since I'm sure there are many other actors in the mix, some of which we may not even know about. Yeah. Um, but uh, thank you for joining us. I wanna thank all of you uh, for joining us. Normally we're able to offer you lunch and now we're no longer able to do that, but hopefully this is food for thought and uh, we'll give you a little bit of time to have lunch before you have to get back to your next class or whatever. So thanks again to all for coming. Special thanks to Josh. Well, Thank you again very much. It was my pleasure. And thank you again for the, the wonderful discussion. Thanks for all your great work. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.